let's delve into AES and talk about you know what's good about it, how it works, and why it was judged good enough to be the advanced encryption standard. So why AES is AES? Uh, what, yeah, why AES is AES, or why Rheindahl is AES? Have you heard of Rheindahl? Rheindahl? No. No. Okay, so in that perhaps slightly infuriating way, I managed to not say anything about how it works in the last video at all. Let's start with a few numbers that we, we briefly mentioned in the last video. Right? AES is a 128-bit symmetric block cipher. That means it takes 128 bits of message and it encrypts it into 128 bits of ciphertext with some key. Now that key can either be 128, 192 or 256 bits. And that gives you just varying amounts of security, right, from loads to ridiculously loads. Right, in my, in my opinion. All right, so don't worry about it. If you, if you find your browser using 128-bit, that's okay. These were specified as part of the AES standard, so Rheindahl had to adhere to this. But just think that we're taking 16 bytes, that's 128 bits, and we're doing something to it that turns it into some ciphertext. And because this is an SP network, we're going to be doing some amount of substitution or bringing in some confusion and some amount of permutation, moving things around to add diffusion. You don't want, just like the Enigma machine, you don't want to have one byte in, one byte out, because it, that's got to be easier to analyze. Uh, and in, historically, of course, it is. Instead of having a long line of, of bytes or bits, um, like most ciphers might arrange things, AES likes to arrange things in a grid, a 4x4 grid for 128-bit. So we have our message, which is 128-bit, that's 16 bytes, as a 4x4 grid, Every time I try and draw a grid, it always goes wrong. So byte naught is going to be in here, and byte one, and byte two, and byte three, and then four, five, six, seven, so it's column major order. So actually what we're doing is we're taking our 128-bit message and we're just laying it out in this order, like this. And then we're going to start doing our SP network. We're going to permute, we're going to substitute bytes, and then we're going to transform this into some way where an attacker can't read what the message used to be. So there are a few different operations that AES will do. But remember that everything in AES happens on this 4x4 grid. All right, so what we're going to do, remember we've got the SP network, we're going to have substitution, permutation, and we're going to add our key in as well at some point. So this is our plain text, and we're going to first bring in a part of our key, and we're going to perform an XOR operation. All right, we then remember we put in our key intermediate between the rounds to, um, that's our secrecy. Right, the rest of the algorithm is fully published in public. Then we're going to do our round. So that's going to be substitute bytes. Then we're going to shift rows. And then finally, we're going to mix columns. And this is going to be our substitution. And this is going to be our permutation. And finally, at the end of each round, we're going to add our key. Add our round key like this. And then this is going to be one round. And the only thing to mention is that the mixed columns is in all the rounds except for the last one because this permutation has no effect on the last round, it just permutes the output, doesn't make, doesn't make any difference. So it's exactly like this, except that this one is missing on the last round. When you've got a 128-bit key, you have 10 of these rounds. When you have a 192-bit key, you have 12 of these rounds. And when you have a 256-bit key, you have 14 of these rounds. But in, in all other regards, they're exactly the same. So this is also an XOR down here at add round key. We don't put the same key in every time. What we do is we take the original key, and as I mentioned in the SP Network video, we expand it using something called a key schedule into different round keys. So this would be sort of key naught, perhaps. So this would be key one, key two, and so on, depending on which round we were in. And so there'll be a key that's expanded for every round. Um, we won't talk in too much detail about the, the key schedule. It's quite simple. Uh, and in fact, it's just meant to be fast, mainly. It just takes your, your shorter key and expands it sufficiently such that you can put it in at these different rounds. That's an overview of what AES does. This is a much, much, much better version. I mean, I, you know, I can't stress this enough. A much, much better version than the one I designed or showed in my SP Network video, right? We're substituting and then we're gonna permute and then we're gonna mix in our round key. And we're gonna do this over and over again until we have a ciphertext. So I guess the question then becomes, what happens here, here, and here of interest? What's particularly nifty for me about um, AES is that it doesn't use the same kind of operations that you might expect. So XOR, of course, happens everywhere in cryptography. But actually, all of the operations within AES are essentially mathematical operations on what we would call a finite field. 
So Dave talked a little bit about Galois fields in his Reed Solomon video. And the answer is by using Galois field theory over finite fields and doing lots and lots of long divisions and additions. So a finite field or a Galois field, which are interchangeable names, um, they, what you have in a field is you have some, some number of elements, so let's say all the numbers between 0 and 10, for example, right? and you have different operations you can perform on that field. So in Rindar, we have a Galois field of 2 to the 8 elements, and then in this field we can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, or x to the minus 1 inversion. The important thing to remember about a finite field, if we don't go any further with the math at all, is that 2 to the 8 elements is a, is a byte, Right, so each element in this Galois field is just a byte. So we start with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. We go all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And so there are 256 of these elements in this particular finite field. Kind of the one take home message that you need to know about this, even if you don't ever look at it again, is that whichever of these operations we do, we produce another element in this field. Right? We never leave the field, we never overflow, we never underflow and go you know, into negative numbers or anything. There's no float representation or anything like this. If we take one of these numbers and we add them to another one, we find a different one. And if we multiply them or inverse, invert them or divide, we go to a different one. Right? Which makes it quite nice for implementing a cipher because a lot of these have an opposite. So for example, addition and subtraction undo each other, multiplication and inversion or dividing, they undo each other. And we can move around this field but we never actually leave our eight bytes. If we've got our four by four byte representation of our data path in AES, this is our 128 bit block. We can perform operations on here within this finite field and by the end we'll still be in the finite field. We won't have gone over to 130 bits or 140 bits or some disaster like that. All right, so we'll bring the diagram back and with that in mind, we will talk about what each of these does. Substitute bytes, that's our substitution box, is literally a lookup table. It's a cleverly designed lookup table. They haven't just made this up. Each byte is mapped to a different byte based on a function in this field. But most importantly, there's a few, there's a few things that they've done to try and design it to be as complicated as possible. Right? So it's very non-linear, so it's very difficult to kind of represent this as a mathematical function, exactly what it is that it does. In fact, let's just do one and then we can, we can yeah, see, yeah. right? So we've got our grid. Let's put this here. Uh, we've got our grid, which I've now drawn many times. This is B0, this is B1, all the way up to B15. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take this byte, we're going to look it up in our table, and we're going to replace it with a different one, right? So our substituted byte, like that. And we're going to do that individually for each of these. To make this function more confusing, it's been designed such that there are no fixed points. That means no byte is substituted with itself, so you don't start with a 15 and end up with a 15. And there are no opposite fixed points, which means all the bits flip. So for example, the opposite of 1010 would be 0101, right? And this is for a whole byte. They don't exist in this, it's been designed that way. So this substitution uh, box is really quite powerful. And, and, and it's one of the reasons why this is a really good algorithm. As it happens also, it's just a lookup table, so it's nice and quick. That's the first thing. What, so we've substituted our bytes, we've taken our plain text, we put in part of our round key, or this is our initial key, and then at the beginning of the round we'll make some byte substitutions using our S-box. Then we're going to shift the rows. This is really straightforward. So we're just going to take the first row and do nothing to it. We're going to take the second row and we're going to move it one to the left. So B1 goes all the way back over to here, right, so they wrap around. This moves this way, and this moves this way, and this moves this way, and this obviously goes to the end. This row moves two, so this goes to here, this goes to here, this goes round back to here, and so on. And this moves three, right? Which is another way of saying it moves that way, but you know. So this one goes all the way over to here, this one goes over to here, and so, and, and so on. Remember, this is gonna be a, an iterative process, and what we want to do is move these things around and permute them. So if this is our data path with our columns, by sharing bytes around the different columns, when we combine it with the mixed column step, which we'll do in a minute, you'll see that actually we're mixing everything up. So within just a couple of rounds, everything is very, very jumbled up, and that's obviously a really good thing because it's going to be much, much harder to break. Right? So we're just taking bytes and we're putting them in a different place in this grid. So that brings us to mixed columns, which goes along with this. Right? So now that we've moved things into different columns, what we're going to do is we're going to take this column here and we're going to mix these right up. We're going to take this column and mix these right up and this one and this one separately. So this is a column-wise 
operation. So this byte has gone over to here and then been mixed into this column. This one has gone over to here and been mixed into this column. So these two operations together are, you know, they're doing a good job of jumbling everything up, right, would be my technical way of putting it. This is going to be done using a matrix multiplication. So let's just turn it off. I'm going through a lot of your paper today. For some column, let's say C0, C1, C2, C3, we're going to multiply it as a vector by a matrix. Right? Now we've dealt with matrix multiplications occasionally in computer file, we're not going to spend too much time talking about it now, but this matrix is 2, 3, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, and 3, 1, 1, 2. Now these numbers, they're big enough and jumbled enough that something interesting happens here, but they're small enough that this is quite fast. Right, on hardware implementations and things like this. If this was 50, it made your algorithm slower. So if you remember from sort of um, linear algebra, a matrix multiplication is going to produce another vector out, so it's going to replace this column with another one, and it's going to be a combination of all of these. So this one times this one, plus this one times this one, plus this one times this one, plus this one times this one, and then we repeat this process for each of the values. So we're taking bits and bytes from all of these in this column, jumbling them up, moving them around, shifting them. And there is a reverse inverse matrix that does the exact opposite when you want to decrypt as well. So although this is doing a good job of jumbling everything up, we can actually also undo it. The only thing to mention, of course, is this is not a normal multiplication in the sense that we're inside this finite field. So our add operation is an XOR and our multiplication operation is a multiplication inside this finite field, right? Which is Modulo a polynomial, and you know we'll, we'll we'll sort of leave that for someone to look into. Or we'll talk about it in some extra bits. So so I guess like once once more from the top, um, we take our plain text and we XOR it with the first part of our expanded key, and then we're going to repeat this process over and over again. So we're going to substitute some bytes using our nicely designed S box. We're going to shift the rows along, and then we're going to mix all the columns up. So we're going to substitute and then permute our data in this grid. Then each time we're going to add the round key, which in this case is XOR, and then we're going to repeat this process, except for the last round where we don't bother to mix the columns because it doesn't really help us. And then at the end we add in our final round key, and that's the end. Right? And out comes the 128-bit block of total gibberish. This can be described as kind of a random permutation. That is to say it takes some input and it performs what appears to be complete randomly producing an output when in fact actually obviously it's had quite a lot to do with this key. If you have the key you can then undo it. Each of these steps has an exact opposite step that we can go back up through to undo this whole process. Does this ever go wrong? You mean, uh, how, how so? Well, it just seems to be so many stages and so many oh, yeah, right, parts right. to it. That, um, that so that's, so that's a very good question because I guess there's two answers to that question. One is technically no because they have what we would call um, test vectors which are this is all zeros. When you put this in with this key, this is what you should get. So you can test your algorithm quite a lot before you would put it into production. Um, but in terms of sort of security issues, actually, yes. Right? So if you get this implementation wrong, you can kind of undermine the security of this whole cipher. There have been things like cache timing attacks and side channel attacks where bits of key have been leaked because people have not given due care to how this is implemented. One of the neat things about AES is because it's a standard, it's now in CPU hardware. So there are AES instructions to perform one round and to perform a final round and things on an Intel and an AMD chip and on others. And they are impervious to these kind of attacks and they're also ridiculously fast. So if you're using AES on a, on a well-equipped CPU with the right instructions, we can be talking gigabits per second of encryption, um, which is you know, pretty good. Uh, so that's why something like BitLocker or some kind of on-disk encryption you won't notice it. You click a file and it's already decrypted it and shown it to you before you can sort of realise what's happened. And it's because of the speed of this kind of stuff. Well, perhaps we'll talk a little bit more about Galois fields, because right? I mean, I like the name. So first of, first of all, please look up Galois, Everest Galois, on Wikipedia, because he's fascinating. Didn't he die in a duel? He died in a duel, right? Having published three landmark papers on finite fields and polynomials and things, right? So, I mean, I'm not a mathematician, so I don't know the, the whole history, but this is a, this is a guy...